Hello, everyone, and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on stream. We are uh, doing a little graphics uh, cleanup today. We we pretty much have uh, stuff in a pretty 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 fancy, if I do say so myself, pretty fancy position here um, on day 384. We're gonna be so you know on day 384. You want to load day 383's source code if you want to follow along. But let me show you. I'm really happy with where things are, uh, and. Uh, we're just doing a little bit of cleanup because at the end of the last stream, I, I sort of did some cleanup to make it so that we always render to a low resolution uh, or higher resolution, actually, whichever one you want, and then scale the game. Uh, and so we can do some fun things like this, where this is like pixel art hero that we kind of made happen, right? Uh, but we didn't quite get a chance to finish uh, everything that I had wanted uh, to do there because, um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and switch us back uh, for now to high res rendering. Uh, here at startup. Here we go. So I didn't get a chance to do everything I wanted to do because one of the things that we were about to do um, with the renderer is, and the reason that kind of w I ended up in that place where you could uh, get that kind of crazy scaling, is I would like to be able to turn multi sampling on if the card supports it. Now we're doing depth peeling uh, for you know, our, uh, the way that we're handling our like depth compositing. So we don't really need the multi-sampling anymore. We can run without it just fine. And that's what I'm doing right here is I'm running without the multi-sampling. But uh, you can also kind of see that what that does is while all of our sprites look nice and clean and smooth, and that's all good, uh, we run into this other problem, which is that all of our sort of line work, right? Like all of our, our geometric primitives, which there aren't going to be a whole lot of in Handmade Hero necessarily, but the ground and walls are sort of these blocks. So they do comprise a significant portion of the screen, even though there's only really one thing in the game that's a, that's a, a cube. It's basically like a solid thing. But that's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of, uh, of, of the image. So what ends up happening is you get kind of jagged lines on the ends of those, and that's just the standard anti-aliasing problem. And the best solution on a GPU for the standard anti-aliasing problem when you're drawing solid 3D primitives like that is usually to use multi-sampling. So what I'd like to do is for cards, for people who have modern beefy cards, which this one that is in this machine is definitely not. Uh, this is a uh, seven-year-old card at this point. So people who have modern cards, you can see that we're running with our depth, you know, the depth peeling here is, is still running quite well, uh, even though that's, you know, overdrawing the screen many times. So given that fact, um, I pretty much can guarantee you that if you ran this on a fancy graphics card, you would have just a ton of horsepower to spare. So as a result, I want to enable the user to, you know, or the game automatically, if it detects that it has enough horsepower, whatever, to be able to turn on multi-sample anti-aliasing here to get rid of the jagged lines because there's no reason not to use that extra power on the card if it's there. If it's not there, the jagged lines are fine. I don't mind them. They're not the end of the world. Uh, and there's certainly not a, a rendering artifact we need to care too much about. But uh, since graphics cards already know the solution to this and have worked out exactly how to do it uh, to a very good ef uh, effect for us, I feel like that's what we want to do. So what I want to do now is just go into the renderer. And today, I just want to clean everything out so that it's switchable easily between multi-sampling and non-multi-sampling so that the game uh, is able to pick which one of those it wants to do and proceed accordingly. Right? OK. So that's all we're trying to do. Uh, pretty simple, but again, it involves talking to the graphics card through a graphics API. And as you hopefully have figured out by now, that is always an exercise in pulling teeth. And I can also tell you that we have had good fortune on Handmade Hero because I have not been doing anything super complicated with the GPU uh, in that we have not hit a lot of real stumpers that take a long time to debug uh, because, you know, you definitely can. Um, and you can hit driver bugs, which, you know, you don't know are there and all these other sort of things. So we're, we've been very fortunate probably because we're a 2D game and not trying to do anything crazy like voxel cone tracing or something like this. But uh, it's just worth noting that I'm making, even though we've had some troubles, I'm making it look a lot easier than it is, uh, or rather I'm not, luck is. Uh, and, and also the type of game we're doing is in the sense that we're just not 
pushing things to the limit uh, that w would, you know, that where things start to, to crumble and fall apart. All right, so let's take a look at what we need to do here. Uh, first of all, we sort of did some work yesterday to simplify the way that we're doing uh, our frame buffer creation. You can kind of see that happening here. We now have this thing called create frame buffer, and when you call create frame buffer, you can actually pass um, in a bunch of uh, stuff here that kind of tells you, oh, okay, here's the stuff uh, that I want this frame buffer, the properties that I want this frame buffer to have, and it will correctly allocate the frame buffer based on those properties. Uh, now we have some parameters here essentially that we want to be able to control. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add these to the OpenGL um, system here where we can kind of say like, okay, let's, you know, let's have some, uh, some control parameters, right? Uh, so up here, I'm just going to introduce some optional switches. Uh, and the optional switches, uh, you know what I might do? I might just make this its own structure. Uh, and the reason for that is that in the future, I probably want to have this be something that the game can change at runtime, potentially, like from a dialog box in the game or something like this. Or um, automatically, like if the game detects that the frame rate's too slow, it can pull off some of these switches, something like this. And so what I want to be able to do is probably, you know, plan for just a little bit. You know, I don't want to be premature about it or anything, but just since it's easy, wrap it in a struct so that I can expect in the future that the game might provide this struct back to me. Um, and it's easy to encapsulate what the switches are here uh, into, or, or I shouldn't say encapsulate because I'm not hiding the frame, but I guess bundle them together. Uh, so I want to have multi-sampling as one of the options. Uh, and I probably also want to have depth peel count or something as one of the options, like how many depth uh, peels do we want to do? And uh, that's probably all we really need here. Uh, the other thing that we could specify in the hardware rendering switches is the resolution at which we want to render. Uh, and I don't really know whether that's appropriate to do here or not, but I think I might just go ahead and say that that's where that's going to come from. So I'm going to have render width and render height in here as well. And that to me sort of looks roughly like uh, the switches that I know, at least at the moment, are things that you could play the game uh, with different settings and they wouldn't change the fundamental rendering architecture, right? Like all of these things we can make pretty easily parameterizable with the way that we have the pipeline set up right now. There's nothing in there that's going to uh, you know, make it so that we have to do huge gyrations in the code to support the different configurations. So that seems like pretty uh, easy to support. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start using those things. Uh, like I I'm essentially going to try to make it so that we can s control these switches however we want, and then we will uh, uh, the renderer will like adjust accordingly. All right, so the first thing I want to do is render width and render height are pretty well pulled out here. Uh, so I just want to check to make sure that nobody's actually using these elsewhere. And it's behind my head, it looks like. Uh, yeah. So render entry, blend render target. Uh, that, at the moment, I think I'm going to nerf. And the reason I'm going to nerf that is because this has changed so much uh, from what we were doing before it, that I think we don't really want to have that be in here anymore. So I suspect we will probably, you know, we might re-enable that in the future. Uh, but in, for the moment, I think I want to pull that out. Because if we were going to do it, we'd have to think it through again. And there's really not much code in there at the moment. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and, uh, and get rid of that push blend render target uh, situation. That's going to get out of there. And, uh, and that'll be it. So... <clears throat> I always forget that I don't define those in this in handmade hero. I do in my own code base. Um, I guess the B32X is, uh, but not the, the U32X. Maybe I should just define them so I can just type them when I type them out of habit. Uh, so really all those are, right, is they're just saying, hey, you could make this as big as you wanted it to be. Uh, that's all they're saying. So it's basically like if I say U32X, what it means is I need something that's at least as big as U U32, uh, but which, you know, in fact, I could do it this way. Just say, hey, by the way, 
here's all those X types. Uh, it's basically just saying, hey, it's something that's at least as big as a, as a U32, but you could make it bigger if you wanted to. So I don't care about the fact that this thing is 32 bits. I care about it can hold at least 32 bits. Uh, and really, this is kind of a holdover. I don't really use it much anymore, meaning I don't have platforms where I switch it on. Uh, but in the past, in, 16, in the 16-bit era, a lot of times you'd want to say stuff like, this is a U16X, meaning if you happen to be compiling on 32-bit, you may want to switch this to a 32-bit value because that may be faster uh, than using a 16-bit value because on a certain chips, it was slower to use 16-bit operations uh, if they have any 32-bit. But in other cases where you're running on 16-bit stuff, running 32 bits much slower. So you wanted to say, hey, use whichever one's faster. It's more of a holdover. You don't really need it very much now. Pretty much, like, I don't really know. Uh, there pro I'm sure there are some out there, but I'm not super familiar with any chip right now where you'd rather switch to a 64-bit number than use a 32-bit number. I, I just don't know of one. That doesn't mean there isn't one, uh, but I don't know if, if it's relevant for games, if there is one. I don't know. But there used to be. <laughs> uh, or at least in the 16-bit era, there used to be. So anyway, that's all that is. It's not very important. Uh, anyway, so back to what I had typed originally. That should work now, right? Yeah. So now that we have these hardware switches, I'm just going to go ahead and do uh, the work there to, uh, maybe I'll do it over on this side so I don't have the risk of going behind my own head. Uh, I'm just going to double check that nobody uses these commands with and, width and height stuff. OK. Uh, <clears throat> so what I want to do now is, and, and what we could probably do too is in the, in the commands, we could have those switches placed in the commands. For example, that's where the switches could come from if we wanted to. Uh, so, you know, in fact, what I could do is, is sort of just pre, you know, be completely premature here and just say, hey, look, where the width and height were before, maybe that's where I'll put them. Uh, because I guess there's really no reason not to do that, right? Uh, so let's see here. Where are those render commands? They're right here. So here are the, those parameters. So what I'll do, I guess I'll just sort of more conform to what we had here and, and say that instead. So now you can see on here, we kind of have like, all right, we're going to send down the parameters for uh, the, the game render commands. <clears throat> uh, and what I might say is, so the depth peel count here uh, and the multi-sampling, maybe that's a hint too. So maybe this is, is sort of understood to be how many I'm trying to do, uh, but it's not a requirement. Um, because, for example, in the software render, we may just want to say that the software render um, can only do <clears throat> specifically just one uh, configuration of depth peeling. So, you know, maybe these are like hints that basically say, look, this is what I, I would like to be doing right now. Uh, you don't have to do that if you can't do that, right? OK. So if I continue with how I was doing this and say, well, maybe in here we have a thing that's like struct uh, game render uh, params or uh, settings, something like this, uh, and I pull this out <coughs> like so, uh, like I was trying to do before, then what I can say is, well, the game render settings can go here. And then what can happen is inside this uh, OpenGL render commands loop, what I could do is I could say, well, you know, maybe we just say if settings have changed, um, and I say that, you know, uh, I have this magical command, which can take uh, two of these setting structures. So, you know, the settings. Uh, that came from the game and the settings that I have. So in OpenGL, uh, you know, I'd have game render settings, current settings, right? So if I have those two things, I basically want to uh, say here, if there was a change since the last time we initialized everything, uh, then we're going to initialize everything again, right? 
Uh, and so I can break off this initialization code then, you know, essentially all of this stuff. Uh, I can break all of this out into, um, let's compare it here, uh, into a routine that only, you know, will execute when we detect that we need to reconfigure everything. And so the nice thing about that is now what will happen is we can change, this will let us change our settings on the fly. So for example, you know, if we want to change the render resolution on the fly, or if we want to change like multi-sampling and stuff on the fly, even though that requires recreating these render targets, that's okay because we'll detect it and we'll close down our previous render targets and create new render targets, right? So it's, you know, that'll be, that'll be easy for us to do. Um, so, trying to think of what else we've got here that's that way. I think everything else is not. So I think everything else is, is pretty good. Uh, yeah. And so the only question is, will we have to recompile some shaders? I don't know that we will, uh, but we could make shader recompilation be part of that process as well. Uh, you know, that would not be difficult to do. So, yeah, like we could t have like the sRGB and stuff in there. It, that's kind of an interesting thing, right? Uh, like just looking at it here, so the compilation, <clears throat> which is this phrase, this phase here, uh, we could pretty easily, right, go ahead and, and do that, uh, that compilation. And, uh, and that would also allow us to have those shaders be sort of predicated on uh, whether or not, you know, uh, whether or not certain settings were set. And I th I'm gonna go ahead and do that because that just seems like the right place to put it because that means we, will know we wouldn't have sort of this incentive uh, in the future to like not have stuff baked into the shaders when we change our settings, we could just bake things into the shaders differently if we wanted to. Now, again, I don't really know that we'll ever need that, but it's easy enough to do that I feel like I might as well just do it while I'm in this pass because that way we won't have this sort of, oops, that's not what I want to do. We won't have like a headwind there essentially where it's like, ah, I don't really feel like doing that because you know, grumble, grumble. Uh, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna place the OpenGL render commands routine at the bottom so it can just call all of this stuff. Uh, and then what it'll do is it'll call um, the OpenGL uh, <clears throat> sort of compilation phase stuff. Uh, where are we getting? Here we go. Uh, and the frame buffer creation stuff, it'll call that whenever it detects that maybe that's something it should do. So we'll just put that right there. All right. Uh, so at startup now, we just won't compile things. We'll only compile things when we go to draw them the first time. And so the only stuff that we're going to leave in here uh, is just going to be like stuff that we know we need to uh, do regardless, right? And I don't know if we want to have this sort of, uh, this test stuff here. This can probably move to the outside now, uh, I mean, to that sort of secondary startup thing, because honestly, if we, if we really want to be diligent, when we create a multi-sample buffer, what we could do now is say, well, we, if we try to create a multi-sample buffer and fail, then we could scale back down. And I don't know if we want to do that or not. Um, yeah, it's kind of a tough call. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep an eye on that and we'll, we'll see what we need to do uh, for that. <clears throat> All right. So this is just going to be our OpenGL, uh, you know, prepare for settings. And this is going to take the game render settings that you want it to use. Um, and what we're going to do is just, at first, we're just going to say OpenGL like settings. I think that's what we called it. Uh, current settings, that's what we called it. Uh, we're going to say the current settings now are now equal to the new settings. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to get rid, like we're going to jettison anything that we uh, or like that we already have. So we have to go through all of our uh, frame buffers and all that stuff and get rid of them if they're already there, right? So I'm not gonna quite do that yet because I want to pull some stuff out first before we do, but this is where this is gonna go. Uh, so here we're gonna do jettison all existing 
frame buffers and programs. And so that will let us like just flush uh, uh, the, you know, basically those two sets of state and then recompile them all. So now we don't have to do that if, because now we know we're just always going to have to create all the frame buffers that we're going to create. Uh, and now we can also take the opportunity to move the frame buffer stuff kind of in, like out into a more appropriate location as well. So let's start cleaning up some of these things here. Um, so uh, people who use the, the width and height directly out of here are going to have to get it out of settings now. Uh, which is not a big deal, right? It's it's literally just since some tactic stuff. It's it's the same. It's still as if it was directly in there. It's not like it's going to incur an extra cache miss or something like that. It's still just sitting there right at the top. Uh, but <clears throat> we do have to grab it out of there. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. There we go. Uh, and now in here, we just need to actually pull out uh, that render width. And maybe I'll just make it easy on myself and just say like, okay, let's call it settings. Uh, and that... Is it just width? It is. All right, uh, so that is mostly all we need to do. We need to compute uh, a max render target index here. What I might want to do is make that value a property of OpenGL. So what I might want to do is say, well, the max render target index is going to be equal to the, op or maybe I'll do it the other way around, the OpenGL. Um, max render target index <clears throat> is going to equal whatever we compute here. Uh, and one of the weird things about max render target index that I don't super love is that it makes it harder to represent the fact that there are no render targets, right? So if I store the max render target index, I can't say that there are no render targets very easily. I would have to say like negative one or something because I can't say zero because that means there is one re render target still in existence. So it's a little bad and uh, we probably want to sort of clean this up. In fact, I guess I'll just clean it up now because why not? So let's write this a little bit more sensibly. We're going to get rid of all of this, right? Um, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually, I'm going to actually do a gen frame buffer, delete frame buffer kind of a thing. I'm just going to do it that way. Uh, in a in a straightforward fashion. So what I want to do is I want to go through here and and you know go by depth peel basically. So I want to say like depth peel index equals zero. Uh, depth peel index is less than depth peel count. Depth peel index plus plus. <clears throat> uh, and then what I want to do is basically nuke all this stuff, right? Uh, so I don't want anything in here at all uh, anymore because we have the ability to create a frame buffer now very cleanly, right? We can say OpenGL frame, frame buffer uh, depth peel buffer equals create frame buffer. Uh, and we can pass the settings that we want here. So we want the render width, the render height, uh, and then we want depth peel flags. Now the depth peel flags we know at least are going to be OpenGL frame buffer color, but we also know that we're going to need depth, right? So then the only question is, do we need multi-sampling? So now what we want to do is again use those settings that we got and say, you know, what's the multi-sampling hint? If the multi-sampling hint is set, uh, and maybe I'll do this. Uh, so that we know one way or the other. Uh, if we're going to try to do multi-sampling, then I'll say, uh, and maybe even go a little bit further and say that there'll be a permanent thing that says on the open jail structure, if we're doing multi-sampling, then the depth peel flags are going to have multi-sampling ored in. So there you can see it's like, okay, I'm, I'm starting to build up something which essentially says, 
We're going to check the settings. We see there's a settings change. We're going to like re-prepare OpenGL. We're going to do that by sort of like progressively figuring out what we can and can't do here. Um, so we have OpenGL multi-sampling. And for now, we'll just set that uh, to be whatever the, the multi-sampling hint is. Right, but in the future, probably what we'll do is we'll only turn that on if the card actually supports multi-sampling, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so one other thing that we want here is in our settings, uh, pixelation hint. Uh, and so pixelation hint is basically this part right here because we had that funny, funny effect, which is like we want things to be pixelated. Uh, so we might as well support that because, again, since we have render settings now, we might as well just throw a few things in there that we might want. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is say uh, there's the resolve flags. And the resolve flags are going to be these flags. But we're going to predicate, again, just like we did before, uh, that secondary part, which is whether or not we do filtering. What we want to do is say, well, if there's a pixelation hint. We'll use it. And now we don't want to do this in the affirmative. We want to do it in the negative. Because if we're trying to pixelate, then we don't want to filter, right? So if we're not trying to pixelate, then we do want to filter, right? So that's you know how that goes. OK. So off we go. Uh, we've got the render width and render height here. Those are doing their thing. Uh, we've got the frame buffer resolve stuff going on here. That's doing its thing. Uh, and we just need to pass the resolve flags instead of the hard-coded flags like before. Uh, now we just need to put that global resolve frame buffer somewhere a little bit more logical. Uh, so where we're going to put that is we're going to say there's an OpenGL resolve buffer. Uh, and that's all there is to that, right? So here's kind of like our, our peeling. Uh, our, I should say our peeling. This is our uh, decrypting. Like we're turning the settings into stuff we can use. Um, then we'll compile our programs, create our frame buffer, and create our uh, depth buffer, our depth peel frame buffers as well. Oops. Uh, I'm going to get rid of all of this. Because uh, now that, look at how much cleaner that is now, right? Looking really good. Uh, so, you know, we're starting to get there, starting to look better. Uh, we need to figure out what that death peel count is. And so at the moment, what we can do is just say, well, the death peel count um, is going to be uh, set by that death peel count hit. So again, just taking it direct for now. Okay. Uh, so then we've got our all of our stuff here looking pretty good. Uh, we probably need to save that depth field count, right? That needs to be recorded. And uh, so maybe what I can do here is just set that directly for the OpenGL thing. As many of those as I can do directly in there probably is a good idea, right? Uh, and yeah, that all seems pretty good. I don't see anything uh, else that's particularly onerous there. And uh, yeah. So that seems pretty good. Uh, and this way too, like I said, now that we're compiling these programs, if we find, and we may, if we find that we need to do something um, extra here in the shaders themselves, as far as you know, uh, being able to handle multi-sampling by switching what kind of shader, what, just some little tiny things in our shader code, it's nice to have the ability to pass parameters to the, compi the compilation of our shaders right at the times when we know what our settings are, rather than having to sort of deal with that dynamically and potentially compile lots of shaders and only use one of them or something like this. This way we know we're just compiling one set and we can co fully customize them in any way that we want. All right. So now we just have to store these. <clears throat> uh, and so what I'll do is say the depth peel buffer here uh, is going to be parameterized like so. And the other thing I'll do is I'll say, well, you know, the depth field hint can't be higher than a certain number, right? So we'll just say, like, in this case, uh, you know, the depth field count, or we'll, we'll, we might even cap it. We'll just say, if the depth field count 
is higher than however many we're saying the max is going to be uh, for OpenGL, which is maybe like eight or something or 16, which is absurd. Like, but hey, you know, you could do it. We'd just say at that point, you really should be using atomics probably, but you know, neither here nor there. We could do an atomics pass someday. Maybe we should. Uh, I don't know if this card even supports atomics, but we could do uh, it when I move to a more modern machine, certainly. So we have death peel count, and uh, we're just checking to see if the death peel count is too large, uh, then I'll just cap it, right? So I'll say, if the death peel count exceeds how many the maximum is going to be for OpenGL, then we'll just cap that right there, uh, and that'll be the end of it. So now we can sort of imply what, we're, what we should have over here for our... For, uh, for what the settings should be, right? And what our storage should be. So you can kind of see here, we've got our programs. That's not gonna change. The texture format, all that stuff, that's all not gonna change. But we now have sort of a, another set of things here that can sort of float around. Uh, we've got whether multi-sampling is on. Uh, we've got how many depth peels we're gonna do. Uh, and we also have uh, one more thing uh, if I remember correctly, which is, where is it? I thought we had one more open gel thing, but no, we don't. I take it back. All right, so that's all we really need to know. How many depth fields we're doing, and are we multi-sampling? Those are the only things that really persist. Uh, then we've got the resolve frame buffer, which is open gel frame buffer. Oops. Uh, and we've got the depth field buffer. And that, let's just say you can set it up to 16, because why not? That's ridiculous, but I'm sure there's cards that could do it easily. Especially if we switch to a texture atlas in the future, I'm sure there's cards that would eat that for breakfast uh, because 16 times overpass with the kind of loads we're passing it. Uh, these cards are monsters these days. Um, you know, you get some SLI configuration with a, you know, big beefy 23 power connectors kind of a card and these things can render anything. I mean, they can't run the Windows 10 desktop without frame hitches, of course, because <laughs> no one's ever built a machine that can do that. But they can render any game you might throw at them, because, you know, what's a game? It's certainly not as hard as drawing some colored tiles with, like, five fonts on them. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and, uh, and get this working here, because we've made a lot of substantial changes. Uh, so, <clears throat> what is this complaining about? Uh, subscript array required, blah, 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 blah. Um, I think we just are missing a semicolon is really all that was about. Uh, yeah, okay, I missed the initial error, that's why. Subscript requires array or pointer type. Uh, that is probably true. That is not what I meant to put there. I meant to put that. Uh, I obviously can't take the array count of a Boolean. Doesn't make any sense. Uh, so now we need to have this settings as changed function, and uh, this is obviously something that's kind of shared, right? It's it's something that uh, would be part of the platform layer probably, and I don't know exactly where we want to put it. Um, I can put it in here for now, but we could move it really anywhere. Uh, but it has to be accessible to everybody uh, because it's you know it's a generic sort of thing that any of the renderers might want to use. Uh, what I might do is just say are equal. Uh, and so that way you can just say, like, are these two things equal? So I'll just say, like, if they're not equal. Oops. So if I want to see if two, these two things are equal, then I'm going to generate a result that just is basically the comparison, oops, of all the things in them. I don't know what I'm looking at here, but I can't apparently kill this buffer. Don't know what buffer it even is. But that's fine. Uh, so let me just finish this up here. Oops. So there's the settings change, and in here I just now need that platform layer. Oh, I see. I created a platform.cpp file, I guess. I don't know what happened there. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter, don't care. Uh, as long as I can keep programming, I'm fine. So here we are in R equal, and what I wanna do here is just take a look at what those settings uh, are and make sure that I compare them all, right? 
so we've got that multi-sampling hint the width the height so here they all are there we go um, so I just want to see basically if a width equals B width uh, and this is just going to be this the whole way down right it's just going to be a a B like that right And this, by the way, is like just, uh, you know, I'll just point this out because, I don't know, it might not be obvious to people or maybe it is obvious to people. But, um, you know, a lot of times I complain about the C++ standards committee, as you know. And, uh, you know, so sometimes I feel like I should make that more concrete. And so when things come up in programming, I'll just, I'll just explain them. So let me, let me give you an example of kind of classic how the C++ standards committee over decades always fails to grasp like the fundamental concepts of how a programming language should work. So take a look at what I just wrote there, right? What I wrote there was iterating in my mind over the elements of this structure and I just wanted to do the equals operator on each of them, right? That's what I wanted to do. So suppose you are a language designer and you're looking at this problem. The way the C++ standard committee universally, in every single instance they have ever encountered for any purpose, and I mean that 100% literally, the way they choose to solve this problem is they go, oh, it looks like there's this concept that people might want to compare two structs to each other. So let's introduce a bunch of rules for how if you wanted to make the compiler generate an automatic operator equals to each other, you know, where one struct equals another struct, let's, let's figure out a way to do that, right? And they write this big, long, complex thing that tries to handle all these edge cases, and they, they battle with each other over like these edge cases about which way should the operator equals automatic generator for the game render settings for, you know, for structs or classes work, and what happens if things are private, and what happens in this case, in that case, and virtual functions, and ah, right? But that completely misunderstands the fundamental operation of programming. At no time in anyone's head when they were programming did they think about this as automatic operator equals. What they thought was, I want to compare each element of this structure. So what it's supposed to look like is this. Right? It's supposed to look like this. And I'm just making up a syntax here, right? Something like this, right? I don't know what you would put here or like for each member, something like that, right? I don't know. Uh, something like this, right? Uh, and I, I'm going to put it for each here. For each member of this structure, I want to do the operator equals, right? I want to do A member equals B member, and I want to say, you know, if they're not equal, or I want to say if they're not this, return false, return true. That's what I was trying to write. And by misunderstanding what the programmer's brain should be doing at that time, and instead thinking of how the language can automate a specific instance, they miss the fact that writing this, if you just had the language support that, you now support every possible thing that anyone would ever want to do that has to apply to all the members of something. This can automatically do the copy thing. This can even automatically do something where you only wanted to copy some or compare some, right? Because now I can do stuff like exclude certain members. Like all I have to do is start introducing what the CPP member thing can do. Like, can I check its name? Or can I annotate it with my own flags, right? Like flag no save, right? And then I can just, or, or no compare, right? And then I can just in here just say, oh, okay. You know, if this member, if, uh, if not a, you know, no compare, right, or whatever. And that lets you build everything that you want to build. 
but they never get this, and I don't understand why. It's like anyone who's been programming for just a few years should know this. Uh, and it's so crazy to me that they can't wrap their head around it. It's like it's the most foreign concept to them somehow, but it's the most basic concept. And I just don't understand. They could get rid of almost the entire spec that they've written by just making a few of these things. It would take like 10 pages of spec for me to write something that can generate everything they do in C++ by just letting the programmer actually iterate over the frickin' program. It's nuts. Anyway, it gets me really worked up because every day I have to deal with this crap and I have to write my own routines and my own preprocessors and all this stuff. And it's like, if someone would just get a clue, we would have had all this stuff like 20 years ago. And other languages do have it. It's not like this is something I'm making up. Like I'm like some language design savant who's talking about things that no one's ever dreamed of before. It's like basic ability to iterate over the structures of things and do stuff to them that generate the code that you want to actually make is just Metaprogramming has been around, I don't even know how long, since the 70s probably, possibly before then, I don't know. Um, it's nuts. Anyway, so I'm still typing crap like this. <clears throat> it's fantastic. All right, so let's see what we've got here. Back to, you know, rant, rant over. Um, so here we are. Uh, we have to now, you know, finish up actually, you know, using these things the way that I said we were going to. Uh, so now we have to sort of loop over things in a, in a more intelligent fashion. So what I'm going to do here is say, all right, uh, we know that we have depth peel count <clears throat> number of these things. Uh, use render targets is now a foreground conclusion. We're a depth peel renderer. You've got to support render targets. We just won't run on cards that don't, right? And we could make a special path in the future for one that's that, that only have one. Um, but you know, at this point, kind of all bets are off. Uh, to a certain extent. So we want to set this uh, stuff correctly. Uh, that last one, the very last one, that when the target index um, is basically the depth peel count minus one. Uh, so here we come, doing our clear, uh, and then we're, we're off and we're, we're finished, right? So we, we unbind the frame buffer. That's pretty much correct now. That's really all that needs to do. Uh, let's take a look at the rest of the places we've used max render target index because those have to change. Uh, so now what we're doing is we, we we're trying to see whether or not the peel index is like the last peel, right? Uh, so when it says render entry and peels, uh, what we need to do is do here is say, okay, we want to know if we're on the last peel. So basically the max render target index here, we could just make up what it is. In fact, we could just do this. Uh, and in this case, we have to make sure that the depth peel count is greater than zero, right? Uh, because we can't render anything if we don't. We could make the whole thing predicated on that, but it doesn't seem very good. I think you just want to prevent people from ever actually doing that. All right. Uh, so let's take a look at the render commands thing here. Oops. All right, uh, moving on. So this is just the initialization, initialization of that struct, which we'll deal with in a second. OK, so I want to skip down to here. <clears throat> Again, just pulling out the settings everywhere. Okay, uh, so now we're down to just the fact that this has to get initialized somewhere, and we have this super crappy macro for it. I do not know why we have a macro for it. Um, to be honest, I don't know why it's not just a struct. That is sort of perplexing to me, and I, yeah, do not know why we have that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to not be a struct because I don't see any reason for it to be a struct. So instead, what I'm going to do is do default 
render commands like so, and I'm just going to make this be an inline function like I would normally do. Maybe there was some platform compatibility thing. And no, at one point, some folks were like actually doing this um, compiling handmade hero in like, uh, what's that, Apple language Swift, I think, um, or something like this. Uh, and so I don't know, there were some weird things we did to make sure that they could do stuff, I think. I, I don't know. Um, I just, I seem to recall this. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and just initialize these things. And I don't really know. So we actually, these are just things that come through. Push buffer, push buffer. So I really don't think there's anything special to do here. Uh, and then we just got I'm literally doing nothing here, right? I'm just So that seems good there, right? Um, the weird thing about this is this is done every time, which I can't say I know why we're doing that, right? Um, Like, we don't really need to initialize this every time. At most, all we would have to do is change a few values. Uh, so it seems a little bit strange that we're doing it that way. It's possible that we might need to make some affordances for having this be different depending on whether or not we're using hardware or software rendering in the future. But at the moment, I don't really know anything in particular. Uh, that really has any effect here. Like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know why this couldn't just be pulled out to something further out. Like, I don't see any particular reason that this has to be inside the run loop. You know what I mean? Um, So I think we can pretty much just do it right here. All right. So now we just need to actually pass something, you know, reasonable parameters for this stuff. So <clears throat> let's just go ahead and do so. Uh, we have width and height. Uh, we have the max vertex count and the vertex array and the bitmap array and the white bitmap. So at the moment, those are the things that the platform actually does supply to us. Uh, and these are settings. Do, do, do. And so so this is actually max push buffer size and push buffer base. Push buffer data at, that's what I meant to say. 
Uh, and so that clear color, I guess we can just, if we don't have the V4 creator there, what I can do is say zero like so. Uh, and then in here, when we do a push setup, the max render target index is not something that's getting tracked anymore. Uh, and the software render commands, yeah. We don't support this anymore. But someday we will. OK. Uh, oh, I guess I was a little bit aggressive there. Where's the push buffer size? There it is. So here's the thing that actually creates those. So we do have to wait till there to create it, because we haven't made the memory for it yet. But that's all good. Uh, and do I have the right parameters to this saucy gentleman right here? Push buffer size, push buffer, width and height, max vertex count, vertex array, bitmap array, white bitmap. So that does look, uh, oops. There we go. Uh, so now, in theory, that should be getting passed correctly to the OpenGL subsystem, I hope. Uh, when we actually do pass it to the OpenGL subsystem, again, in theory, uh, what should happen here is that the first time through, it's going to just test to see whether or not uh, these two structures have the exact same contents you know, or not. Uh, and <clears throat> if assuming they do have the same contents, which I suppose if we wanted to duck the C++ standards pretty altogether, in this case, since we care about every last little thing being equal, we could just do a mem compare here. But, you know, that's, that's just luck, because we happen to want to compare actually everything. So then what we want to do is say, okay, OpenGL prepare for settings. <clears throat> Go through here, make sure we set everything correctly. Uh, compile our programs, create our frame buffers, and then in theory we should be ready to go. Now, we still have some vestigial remains here that we have to move out uh, because we're still using this nonsense here, right? This OpenGL frame buffer uh, sort of gunk that we have. And we don't really want that to be happening, right? We don't want any of these things anymore. Uh, so we need to delete all of this, and then we need to make this stuff work without any of that, right? Uh, so now what we want to do is we want to take a look at the places where we're actually uh, using this sort of stuff and make sure that we have you know, some, some handle on what's going on. So here we're trying to bind a texture from the depth peel frame buffers, right? Uh, well, we can do that pretty easily, right? Because we know we've got the depth peel uh, buffers in our OpenGL struct. And we know in this case we're just trying to load, uh, oops, we're just trying to load the depth buffer uh, out of one of these, right? Uh, so we just want to set the death buffer and say, hey, we're going to grab the death buffer out of this. Off we go. It's no big deal. Uh, everyone's, you know, everyone relax. Uh, we don't want to deal with that function just yet. Uh, let me see here. Depth is not a, uh, what is it? Is it depth texture? What is it? Oops. It's going to be in here. Depth handle. So, uh, so we'll pass the depth handle there. So that gets bound. Um, then we have here this GLDraw frame buffer, global resolve frame buffer, uh, undeclared. Let's see. One. Global resolve frame buffer is OpenGL resolve frame buffer dot frame buffer handle. Uh, and here we're binding those peels. Uh, these are the color textures for the peels. So what we want here is OpenGL uh, depth peel buffer. And we want the color handle. Uh, then we've just got that. We're going to ignore that for one second. And this. So here we do OpenGL uh, resolve frame buffer, color handle. And we're just down to this. So I'm going to look at where bind frame buffer happens. And what we're actually passing here. So in all these cases, we're just passing like the indexes, right? 
Uh, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say probably what I want to do is have OpenGL frame buffer be the thing that we pass here. And then what I'll do is say, well, if the frame buffer is a valid pointer, uh, then use the frame buffer handle that's associated with it. Otherwise, just pass zero. That way you can target either type here uh, and it just works in theory. Uh, so, okay, so here we want the uh, OpenGL depth peel buffer for whatever that target index is. Uh, and this is going to be the, the, the frame buffer handle, right? Like so. Uh, and then we've got here this one that's doing the, the peel index or whatever. Uh, again, that's going to be OpenGL dot depth peel buffer. And that's it. Uh, so now we've just done a ton of changes, so I have no idea if anything's going to work at all. Probably not. Uh, but, you know, what are you going to do? So at this point now, we've got sort of one thing that we went a little bit further than probably we should on. Uh, and that is specifically the fact that we, uh, we set that multi-sampling hint to true, which is probably bad. Uh, so what I'm going to do at first is I'm going to force the uh, multi-sampling off just so we can get things working and then I will, you know, so we can debug everything back to the way it was and then we'll work on being able to set multi-sampling to true. So I'm just going to set that to false right now so that no matter what hint you tell it, you're not gonna multi-sample. So now uh, we can get started. So here we are in OpenGL prepare for settings. Uh, you can see the settings here that we're getting. Uh, and that's just not the settings we're supposed to get, right? Uh, that's just totally not even on the table. So I would like to find out why we're getting those, obviously. Uh, so here's my win main. Uh, it looks like we're, we, we sort of did come through here. Um, So I'm not sure what happened to those settings exactly. But let's find out. So here we could go to render commands. I'm going to look at those render commands. Uh, so here are the settings. And you can see that they're correct. That's what I would expect them to be, right? Uh, so now the question is, when we go through to actually do the rendering, uh, you know, what happens? Why are we getting something weird? Do we act, do, I, do I clear those out somewhere? Uh, you know, I don't I don't really remember what we did here uh, in this part of the code. Oops. <laughs> Thank you for popping up my window, but uh, at the moment I kind of need to be back here. Uh, so off we go. You know, we're doing our thing. We're going into the renderer here in a second. Um, do do do. Setting up the input. Uh, dealing with mouse buttons and things. We'll just skip over this to the game update. Uh, there we go. Game update and render. Uh, and we're passing the render commands here. And you can see we're passing the address of the one that we think we're passing. Uh, so when we come in here, in theory, we should see that the settings are correct. You know, and and they are. So that's good. Um, so I'm going to come back out here. And you know nothing, nothing bad has happened yet. So now we're going to come through here, and the sound's going to do its thing. right? So here's the sound stuff, which we have sounds turned off at the moment, because we don't want to have to listen to them during debugging. Uh, but they're, they're there. Uh, so then we're going to come through, and we're going to process the, the frame end stuff. Again, that's going to use the same render commands. Uh, and then, in theory, like we should be able to just uh, let's see here, manage textures, texture first free, that's all fine, textures, uh, display buffer in window. So this is the part that's that's having trouble, uh, and and we kind of we kind of nerf ourselves there, right? Uh, and so I'm not sure what's going on. So let's back up a little bit here and let's just see. Uh, what's getting passed down. So here's the win main. 
Uh, and there's the render commands, right? You can see them, they're still right here. So just inside Win32, um, inside here, uh, let's see if we're getting reasonable things. Here's our commands. Nope, they're still reasonable there. So we come down in here to render commands, and we're looking at this render commands. And let's see what this has got for us here, commands. Uh, it's got the right settings. So I must just be doing something stupid in here. Oh, and yes, I am. I'm passing the old settings. So that's just a, that's just a typo, right? A dumb typo, nothing, uh, nothing too, nothing too concerning or weird happening there. That's just me forgetting to pass the new settings instead uh, I pass the old settings. Maybe I'll call this change to settings. All right, uh, so now we're at least running, but we're not running correctly, right? We're seeing a gray screen instead of what we should be seeing, which is you know some kind of a valid uh, rendering of the game. So now we just have to go through, uh, and this is the unenvious part of any kind of 3D graphics programming. Uh, we have to go through and figure out what we messed up, right? Uh, and this is, again, I just wanna reemphasize this many times uh, until we can switch to a better machine on Handmade Hero. Normally, in any normal development environment, at this point, you would switch to some kind of a graphics debugger if you have one. We don't have one that we can use on this machine. Uh, but if, you're, if you have access to, say, if you, on an NVIDIA card and you can run Nsight, that makes this kind of problem where you just like, I know this is a functional pipeline. I was running it just a little bit before. I did a bunch of cleanup where I had to rearrange some things, and now I get a black screen or whatever, or our equivalent of black screen, which is gray screen. When that happens specifically, something like Nsight really ha can help you because basically you can see at what part things went wrong because you can ins inspect individual stages in the pipeline. Uh, whereas we can't do that. So what we have to do is, is you know, go through the standard black box debugging process, which like I said, I don't mind doing on the stream at all. It takes longer, but um, it's a skill that you do need to have if you're an engine programmer because you won't always have good tools. It's kind of a luxury in the modern era, the fact that people have made tools like Nsight or RenderDoc that do, you know, when they are working, uh, or if you have a machine on which they will work, they do offer you a great deal of insight. But it's exactly analogous to modern debuggers where, you know, it's definitely a luxury that we have something, as much as I complain about Visual Studio's debugger, it's still a very good uh, tool compared to having nothing, right? Uh, and having nothing is something that you occasionally have to deal with. You may be working on hardware that literally just does not have tools on it yet, or the tools that are on it are too broken to use or too buggy or who, who knows what. And so, or maybe you're just working on a kernel or like an operating system or something and you haven't, you know, you, you don't even have the ability to hook up a debugger to it, right? And you have to um, sort of bootstrap it until you can get to the point where that's something that can be done over a remote you know, connection or something, who knows, right? So, you know, part of being a consummate engine programmer is being able to do black box debugging for sure. So it's a good skill to have, even though, like I say, uh, I would emphasize there's no glory in it, right? So don't, n don't black box debug something you have the ability to transparent box debug, <laughs> whatever you want to call that. Um, it's really not black box, more like opaque box. It doesn't matter what color the box is, it matters that you can't see through it, right? So it's opaque box versus transparent box is really the more kind of important thing to say, but you know, you get the idea. Uh, so that's the way we're gonna have to go through this, but you know, we'll take it one step at a time and it'll be slower, but it's fine. So what we need to do now is we know that we had a working pipeline and we know that I broke it. So really all I have to do is figure out where in the pipeline I broke it, possibly multiple places. So what we wanna try to do is force um, OpenGL's hand to show us where it is breaking, right? That's what we wanna do. Uh, and you can tell that there's multiple points at which we could break, right? So one place that we could break is you know, at the very end. We could be doing everything correctly, but then something I changed, like made it so that we don't store the resolve buffer texture handle correctly. And so when we go to do our final stretch to the screen, we don't get anything, right? Or something like that. 
so there's tons of things like that that could be happening, and we don't know which one of them uh, we are experiencing right now. So what we have to do is kind of poke at it and see like, you know, where along the, the lines uh, we're going wrong. So let's just try some things first to see what at all, you know, using kind of structured art, what at all it is we're looking at. Because I don't know, I'm just seeing a gray screen, I don't know what else is going on. So here we can see that we're, you know, doing that final blit, right? Why can I not, there we go. Uh, and you know what, that's going really slowly. I wonder if we're having something where we're doing this like every time or something like that. Doesn't seem to be the case. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, that's sort of what I expect to see there in terms of, of the, you know, the, the black boxing of it there. Uh, so looking at that, that doesn't concern me too badly, right? That, that seems to be okay there uh, for the most part. So the other question I would have here as far as the, um, as far as the final stretch is concerned there, I would like to know uh, perhaps whether or not that texture is being read from properly. Uh, so what I would like to do in the in the final stretch there is maybe go into the program here uh, and I, you know just figure out if I'm if I'm running correctly so here's the, the final stretch code uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to force the red channel to one so that I can verify that you know that shader is running right uh, so that's a good sign that shader is running it seems to be running in the right place at the right time so that's good um, we don't really know whether this texture is being read from correctly and that's a harder thing to test because we don't really have a way of forcing that texture to have particular contents in any way that's really particularly reliable. That's a harder test to do uh, with the way that we uh, have to work with you know, these. We can't reach in and poke at the graphics memory very effectively, uh, which is how we would have wanted to do that. So let's take a look here at how we're generating that texture. And maybe let's also take a look at what that texture actually is as far as which handle it's assigned to at the time, right? So let's go in here and say, you know, let me look at, at this final stretch call here. Uh, we know that that shader is running properly, but let's take a look at the open jail struct and just see what we're actually sending down there. So uh, here are our buffers, you know, that we've got. Let's take a look at them. So you can see that this, this looks pretty good to me, right? The frame buffer handle of one seems like exactly what it should be because that's the first frame buffer handle. Uh, and this is the first frame buffer that we allocate. So that makes reasonable sense if you assume the driver just gives them out in order starting at number one. Uh, the color handle of seven makes sense because we do allocate other things before this texture handles and so forth. And a depth handle of zero also makes sense because remember the resolve buffer doesn't use depth testing. So there is no need for a depth buffer on the resolve buffer. Our depth peel buffers similarly look about as good as you could hope. Two, three, four, five, which are the next uh, frame buffers in the sequence makes sense. Eight, uh, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So all of those look like anyway, they have been um, created correct correctly uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, we also have the render width and height look about right. We've got, you know, pretty much all this stuff seems seems reasonably good uh, for the most part. Again, it's a little bit hard to tell. So I'm pretty happy with that. However, we have other things that could be creating problems in here. Uh, and so what I would like to do is just make sure that, you know, the when we create these uh, textures, we're doing everything correctly. So here in OpenGL, uh, sorry, I'm in the wrong place. I wanted my, yeah, create frame buffer. So here in uh, create frame buffer, we pass the width, height, and the flags. Uh, I don't know for certain uh, if we did everything correctly here. Oh, uh, that's not where I meant to do that. That's a, a little bit of a mistake. Sorry about that. Uh, where I actually wanted to do that was here, um, where we say open gel multi-sampling, I wanted this to be false. Now that won't change anything because that should still have exactly the same effect, uh, but just want to make sure. Okay. 
so yeah, that's what I meant to do. I meant to kill it here, uh, not in the other place. All right, so in theory, yeah, this has basically all the stuff that I would have expected to have. Uh, the programs are compiled the way I would expect them to be compiled. Uh, the frame buffers are getting created the way that I would expect them to get created. So now the question is just what is the secret thing uh, that's not quite right here? So one thing that's definitely true um, So that depth peel count there, I'm not sure about the depth peel count either. So what I would like to do is I'd like to go back and say, uh, you know, one of the things that I realized about having the depth peel count being programmatic that we don't really technically support um, is the fact that our final composite really only supports four no matter what. So, you know, it's a little bit harder to figure out how that would work. Uh, but we could write that shader in a way that, that would, you know, allow us to do something more creative there. So maybe we'll look at that in the future. Anyway. Um, so anyway, uh, what we want to do here is figure out, yeah, okay, so are we getting any data on these depth field buffers or aren't we, right? Like, what's the, what are we, are we ever drawing anything to these depth field buffers? And so one thing that I should be able to do, at least in theory, is I should still be able to use this, um, this uh, sort of end part right here to, you know, to blit these two frame buffers together. So if I was to say, let's take the render width and the render height um, and draw that to the draw region, right? Uh, if I was going to do that, what would I get here, right? So if I, if I was to look at, say, the depth peel buffers, uh, so here's a depth peel buffer. What would happen if I bound that uh, and then drew from it, right? Uh, so that's depth peel buffer zero, and it looks like there's nothing on it, uh, and that's troublesome. Now, I can verify that I'm actually drawing to the one I think I'm drawing um, from by setting, you know, again, just poking in there and saying, hey, let's see if I can see red, so I can. So this suggests to me that our problem is really just in the render phase. It looks like we're not drawing anything. Right, uh, And so we need to figure out why we're not drawing anything. At least on the first depth peel, you'd think we'd be able to draw something uh, onto something. Uh, so where do we bind that frame buffer, right? Uh, so if we come through here, you can see us specifying the buffer data. You can see us setting up uh, the textures for the depth peeling. Uh, but where is the open, where do we bind the frame buffer? It looks like we commented that out for some reason. I don't know when we did that. Did I do that just now? But where is the bind frame buffer call? Oh, I guess it happens in here? No, it would have to happen up here, right? How were we doing this? Yeah, I don't really know what this was supposed to do exactly. So I guess the problem is just we're never targeting any of these frame buffers. That's just kind of busted. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. There's a couple ways we could do that. I'm not sure which one we really want to do, but I think we probably just want to target the frame buffer right in here, uh, right? We just want to say like, hey, When you start out, uh, here we need to target whichever one of these uh, you're on. There 
go. Okay, so that's a lot better now. We're actually seeing one of these things. That doesn't look like the frontmost frame buffer to me, to be completely honest with you. Um, so that's a little weird. Uh, and also, it's not animating, which is extremely weird, <laughs> I might say. Uh, so things are still bizarre, but we're getting closer, right? Uh, yeah, and if I take a look at what the peel index is here, the first time through the peel index should be zero. So in theory, right, uh, that should be fine. I also don't know when we come outside here and we set the frame buffer handle back to zero, I'm not sure how that was working in the past because that that depth peeling shouldn't have. So I think the only way this was working is because of that max render target stuff was sort of saving our bacon there. So this, this stuff is actually just totally wrong. Actually. Right, we were, we were doing this pretty, pretty wrong. Um, So I might say that, that, you know, it's a little bit hard to figure out exactly how we want to do this, but I kind of feel like what we wanted to do is just say, you know, the depth peeling happens and then you write to the frontmost peel uh, thereafter. So you kind of want to just say, hey, uh, at the outset, you're targeting the first depth peel buffer. Uh, when you're no longer doing it, you're also targeting it. And then at all other times, you're targeting whatever the, you know, the depth peel buffer is uh, for somewhere in between there, right? Um, that seems like roughly correct to me. So I'm going to say that's just how that goes. Uh, and furthermore, during the begin peel part of things, we could do this a little bit more cleanly. Um, you know, we could do something a little bit more like, hey, when we begin the peels, we set to whatever the peel index is, uh, the target there, and uh, and off we go. So this looks a little bit better here to me. Um, I don't know, it's a little arbitrary. Uh, I feel like we could probably stand to clean it up a little bit more than we have, but it's not awful. Uh, it's like, it's okay, right? Um, so if we're peeling, so yeah, okay, so I also should say the peeling is only if we're at peel index greater than zero. Because the first time through, we're not technically peeling. Yeah, wow, so something's totally messed up a little bit beyond that though, right? Uh, but we're getting a little closer. So again, that's just splitting the frame buffer. I'm gonna see if now, if the rest of the pipeline's working, I suspect it probably is. Uh, yeah, but we've got, some, we've got some really other very weird things. I do wonder if that maybe is just because we're not, and this is probably the case. So remember when I said, why do we do this? I think it's because we need to reset this every time, the push buffer part of it, right? Because the push buffer goes forwards and then it, it would never go backwards. Uh, so the render commands part, really needs a like a reset um, here so when we get down to the end of it to 
be like right here. Uh, so after we're done with the frame display and we draw everything, uh, then at that point we would want to reset, uh, you know, the frame, the, the render. So if we take a look at what has to happen there, we'd say, well, the render commands uh, push buffer base needs to, uh, oops, the render command push buffer data at has to equal the push buffer base. Uh, and the render commands vertex count needs to equal zero, right? So we just need to like reset. Um, so we're getting there, but we're not there yet. Like now we've, we've undone the major damage there, uh, but we're not quite there yet. You can kind of see, it looks sort of to me like we're not quite depth peeling, like we're just looking at the frontmost peel probably, um, I think. Uh, don't quote me on this, but I think. So why are we only seeing the frontmost death peel? Let's just verify that that's true or that, that something like that is true. Uh, so actually, let me go over here so we can see that without it being behind my head. All right, so here's peel zero. Uh, so it's not quite just the front one. Uh, let's get peel, you know, this the, the next layer back. So there's the next layer back, and as you can see, not particularly compelling. Here's the next layer after that. So it looks like we're not drawing, so I probably just broke that loop. So let's take a look here um, at what's gonna happen. So we're gonna come into render entry begin peels. We're going to look at the uh, uh, header that we're on at the moment and we're going to say that's the jump point. So we're just going to do a loop here. We're going to jump back to here. We want to bind the peel frame buffer that goes with whatever peel index we're on, which the first time through will be zero. Future times hopefully will not be zero. Uh, then we set the peeling to whether or not we're on the first one. So we're not considering peeling if we're only going through once. Uh, we are going to be peeling when we come back through the second time. So then we say, okay, the render entry peels uh, in this case let me just make sure this is right here too. Target index death peel count, and these get freed. Uh, that looks roughly correct. Uh, so we come back down through to the render entry uh, peels end. And so at the end of that, we're gonna say, if the peel index is less than the max render target index, uh, then what we need to do is jump. Uh, otherwise, we're done, right? If we've done the last one, uh, we're good to go, right? So if we're not done, we jump back to the beginning and we increment the peel index, which will lead us to bind the next buffer, right? hopefully, um, and to set peeling equal to true. Otherwise, we'll say, let's make sure we've done all the ones that we're gonna do, and let's bind that last buffer back again in case anyone has any non-depth peel drawing to do, it'll go on to the front peel. So then we've got render entry group uh, clear. I don't know that we care that about that very much uh, because that's literally only for the debug system. Uh, we want it to work, but we don't care about it right now. Then we've got uh, entry texture quads. The textured quads is the thing that actually does the drawing, uh, pretty much all of the drawing. So in here, when we come through, if the peeling is equal to true or if it's equal to false, there's two different paths. The false case will not set up a peel texture, the true case will. Uh, and so in that case, when we are setting up a texture to peel from, uh, you can see us doing it here. What we're doing is saying, grab the one uh, that's whatever, that's one behind the one that I'm currently bound to, which seems like the correct thing to do. Uh, and we should already be targeting the correct uh, target because we did it up here, right? We should have set it to the correct target in render entry begin peels. Uh, so here's what the problem is, it looks like, is in this case, we're gonna increment, so we don't. We never actually run this code is what looks like is the problem. Uh, so I think I do, right, because we're gonna increment over that header. So it's gonna skip the that begin. Um, so it does kind of look like in order to do this, I will have to leave it in here. Like I will have to leave it like this. Um, but what, I guess that's not a huge deal. Uh, so that looks better. Now we're getting that, that death peel. So let's take a look and see if I've restored us to good working order here. Maybe I have. Uh, 
Uh, that's looking correct to me now. Uh, I don't see any obvious problems. This looks like it looked before. Uh, the depth fades looking pretty good. All the particles look good. Um, yeah, so I think that's pretty good. Uh, so there we go. Okay, good. Uh, and now the other thing that's nice about this is we should be able to make some like renderer settings kind of things here as well. Um, just just uh, out of that sort of that platform set of things that we have here. So, you know, if we want to, we can now make some of these settings be things that we can edit. Uh, so, for example, if we want to, we can go into uh, handmade.cpp and where we set the renderer here, uh, what we should be able to do is, is set a bunch of uh, debug flags uh, that can be changed here, right? And uh, yeah, I don't ever remember how to do any of this stuff, but let's just say that we were going to do render commands dot settings. Um, and uh, m pixelation hint was one of them, and multi-sampling hint uh, was like another one of them or something. Uh, now, I don't know if that'll actually work, uh, because I never remember how the debug system works. Uh, <laughs> but it looks like that's fine. And so you can see us be able to change these two, and they should change at runtime, and they do. Now, the important thing to remember is we're not done yet, uh, because at the moment, we do not actually delete any of our resources. So if we were to wail on this button enough, in theory, we should run out of memory or something on the graphics card, right? Like, because we are not freeing, um, when we create a bunch of new frame buffers, we're not freeing the old frame buffers. So we do need to go do that. Uh, but it's nice to know anyway at this point, um, you know that we that we uh, have that option. So let's go in here and see. Uh, in terms of what our other settings are, uh, I don't know that there's anything else in particular. So let's just go ahead and and try to enable multi-sampling, and also let's try to enable cleanup, right? So what we want to do here in our, our cleanup code is you can, you can see what we've got. I don't know how much time I have left. What, what, what time do we start? Does this thing know? Does InsoBot know? 30, 33 minutes until Q&A, it says. Um, so, uh, So that's quite some time, I think. Uh, all right, so what I want to do here is I want to say, you know, uh, I've got these resources that I allocated. And, you know, I can kind of, I can group these together, right? Uh, and say something like this. Uh, that all of this stuff, you know, kind of is on the table, right? Meaning all of this stuff up here is stuff that you don't really have to worry about because these like reserved blit texture, vertex buffer stuff, those are things that stay around and it doesn't matter how many times you change the settings, you don't need to worry about them. These on the other hand are, right? So what we want to do here is just say, okay, when we, you know, go to do our settings change, we just want to make sure that we loop through all the stuff we might have to free and free it, right? Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. Here is OpenGL change to settings. So what I want to do here is, in fact, let me just do it here. Uh, so what I want to do is first I want to, you know, free frame buffer or release frame buffer, whatever you want to call this. Uh, I want to free that resolve frame buffer. Uh, and then I want to loop through and I want to free all these frame buffers.
And we don't really store the depth peel count here, do we? Oh, we do. Good. Um, and maybe I'll grab these two since they're sort of... There we go. Uh, and that, if we did that, that's really the only resources we create. Because you can kind of see down here we only create these two resources. So the only other thing we have to free are our programs. So we just need like a free program call, right? And we need to free all of these things. So this is basically free all dynamic resources, create new dynamic resources, right? So now we just need these two calls. We need a way to free the frame buffer and we need a way to free a program. Uh, and so I don't remember much about the program thing. I know they have OpenGL program common, so that's really all we need here. And I'm pretty sure that the shaders are already free. Uh, so let me just page this back into my head how we were doing that here. Um, we have a, a create program call, right? You can see it. and. I'm not sure exactly how we were doing this. So here's create program. We specify that we want to compile these shaders. We then attach the shaders and validate the program. Now, I think we want to actually delete the shaders at this point, I think. Um, I think? I don't know. Uh, but I think we want something like this. Uh, let me just let me just double check. Yes. Um, so I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So you can see here, right? Like. It basically says that you can do this right away. So we can basically say like, hey, we don't need this anymore, just so you know. And that way we don't have to store this information because we don't care, right? Uh, so that'll just say when you delete the program, delete the shaders is basically what it's doing. Uh, so what we want to do is, is then say, okay, now we need a way to delete the program proper. Uh, so when we come down here to uh, that free program call, all we need to do now, the only thing that we have left over is the program handle itself. So we just need a way to delete the program. Uh, and so let's go ahead and do that. So frame buffer, uh, oops, that's in the wrong place. Frame buffer, that's good. Program, uh, prog. Uh, and then the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set program prog to zero, just so we can see that it's zeroed out. Uh, that seems like a good idea to me anyway. Uh, and then here, let's go ahead and say uh, we need to do our frame buffer stuff. So our frame buffer has a couple of different things in it. It's got a frame buffer handle, a color handle, and a depth handle. So what I want to do there is I want to do like GL delete textures. And I want to delete the texture handles. And I also want to delete the frame buffer. Uh, so I'm going to do frame buffer handle, color handle, depth handle. Uh, let's see what delete frame buffers is about. Hello? Uh, so it's exactly the same. 
So this will delete the frame buffers and textures so that they're no longer in use. But what I want to do is, I, since I don't really know what these have and don't have, I'm going to use zero uh, as the way of knowing that they're not there. Now, I think that's allowed in OpenGL, meaning I don't think OpenGL will re return zero. I know that that's true for delete frame buffers. I'm pretty sure it's true for textures too, because you can do bind texture zero. So texture zero is not a valid texture to be like owning. Uh, so all I'm going to do here is say, well, OK, if the color handle um, is zero, don't do this, right? Assume that you never created one. Um, and the same will be true with basically all of these. So they're just checking, hey, you know, if zero's, if, if it's actually said to something valid, get rid of it, otherwise don't, right? Uh, and I think that should be all we really need to do. Now, I don't know if we ever got some of these. Uh, yeah, so delete shader, delete frame buffer, uh, and what is it, prog handle? What What is the name of that actual field, prog handle? I am nothing if not unnecessarily consistent. Uh, OK. So looks like that's all there is to it. Uh, and so now I just need those open jail calls. And I think we're done. Uh, and then we can kind of flip back and forth between them pretty much at will. All right, uh, so let's go ahead and get those. Uh, we still, we're not having any problems, sorry, because the web was a little fishy there. No, no drop frames, good. Um, the, when the web, when, when, I, when it's slow to access the web, I always worry that maybe the streaming has broken, uh, or, you know, or something like this. Uh, this is on Comcast Business Internet otherwise known as the worst internet service I've ever used. Uh, if you thought Comcast home internet was bad, wait till you try their business class service. It's three times the price and one-tenth the service. All right, let's take a look. Uh, what do we have for, for OpenGL stuff here? We've got to have our delete calls, basically, and core arb to the rescue. Here comes the core arb header. There it is. Uh, so we need delete program. Let's go ahead and grab that. Why are there two of them? Oh, delete program pipelines. OK. Uh, so we need these two, delete program and uh, delete, <coughs> excuse me, delete shader. There we go. Uh, and oops, I, I need those as well. It's like Price is Right theme music weekend. Uh, All right, so we need those two, and we also need um, the delete frame buffer call, because I don't think we have that either. Uh, so I just want to grab that one and sauce it in there. Uh, there we go. And... Uh, it's supposed to be delete frame buffers, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so that's that's that. Uh, so now I should just be able to grab all these, and that's it. All right, so we've got all our open gel functions now, and I think that should just work. Uh, delete frame buffers is the actual call. 
Now, unfortunately, there's not, again, without a GPU debugging tool, unfortunately, there's not a lot of good ways to test this out. Um, so like, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, so there's, you know, like, uh, if it was just us allocating memory ourselves, um, it would be a lot easier to determine because what we could do is we could look here uh, at you know the the various sized stuff that we're looking at, and we can see whether or not we're like going up uh, sort of permanently or not. It's harder to do uh, in a situation where we can't you know because it might be the graphics card might be hiding the fact, uh, and it won't be attributed necessarily to our process. So I'm just going to wail on this for a while and see where we're at. Um, And again, like it's like I said, it's really hard to say. Like it looks like we're thrashing a little bit there potentially, right? So I'm not super. It's I guess really hard to say. Like, you know, maybe that's just something the driver is doing naturally, and it's not our fault, or maybe we're not freeing something. You know. Um, so it's a little hard to know. Uh, we could use a call. There's card specific calls that you could use to figure out how much memory you actually have uh, on the card. Uh, and it could be that that would uh, help, help us figure that out. Mm. Yeah, so it's hard to say. So I'm not, I'm not 100% convinced. Uh, I'm gonna put a little to do on this guy in case we want to take a look at it in a little more uh, detail later. So, you know, I think I'm telling it the right things to get rid of the stuff that we allocated because you can see like I come through here and I can look and say, well, okay, I compile four programs and create one plus depth peel count frame buffers. And so in theory, if I free one plus, fr ah, <laughs> there we go. Ha ha. Try that one more time. And again, this is not the right way to verify this. I can't stress that enough. It's just the, the poor person's way of doing it uh, at the moment. Uh, so I can't, again, really can't tell. It it's, looks a little better maybe, but again, I can't tell. That number is going up, right? So I'm not 100% sure that everything's okay. Uh, but I can't tell because I don't know if that's just the driver caching more shader compiles or something like this, or whether it means I'm not freeing everything, right? Uh, and so in order to independently verify that, I need something better than this, but I don't have anything better than this right now. What I want to do is see a thing that says, what are the open handles on this thing? Um, and I'm not sure whether or not I can get that. Uh, so what, you know, what I might be able to do is like GL get, um, and you know, maybe I can, oops, I don't want the open GL ES version. Uh, maybe I can get, you know, something here that, that says how many of something there are. 
uh, so that I could say, you know, how many of these things do you think there are right now? And, and I can verify that it's not going up, right? Uh, so that would be nice. I, I don't know if there is such a thing though. Uh, you know, I can get maximums of stuff obviously, but I don't know that I can get a thing that actually tells me, hey, uh, how many of these things you, have you got? Yeah, so I guess we'll, I'm going to leave that to do in because like I said, I'm not, not super sure about it, right? Okay, so now I'm going to leave this, uh, we're running out of time here, I guess. I'm going to leave this uh, as is because it's in relatively good shape now. Uh, I'm going to leave this as is, but I'm going to turn the multi-sampling part back on. Uh, and that way we can uh, see what we have to do to, in order to, to improve that, right? Um, so, oops. Oh, well this is, we know what this is. This is the, the thing where we can't create a sRGB. Um, oh, well, no, that isn't what this is. This is probably the, um, this is probably the fact that we can't read from a, a we, we are not allowed to read from a texture that's multi-sampled as if it was normal, right? Um, I assume is what that is. Uh, all right, so that's what we have to do. Um, Uh, and so we've got ourselves set up now so that we can do these switches and we should be good to go pretty much. Uh, and we can change the resolution on the fly as well so if we want to. Um, and so we should be in a good position for next weekend to get multi-sampling working, clean up those jaggies and anything else that we might want to do there. Uh, and I'm guessing, like, I don't really know how we're going to approach it necessarily, but my assumption is we probably don't quite want to do it, like, we don't need multi-sampling on all of our depth peels probably. We probably just need multi-sampling on the front most depth peel would be my guess. Uh, and any depth peels beyond that probably just don't need it. That would be my guess. Uh, furthermore, the Z buffer probably doesn't really need to be done that way. So I think probably what we'll do uh, is just multi-sample the front color buffer. Uh, and that would be it, right? Uh, so multi-sample the front color buffer, blit it down to a regular buffer, rest of the pipeline as normal. That'd be my assumption. All right, let's go to a Q and A. Oops. There we go. Gary Johansson, so one of my left field questions, do you think there is a case to be made for a GL implementation to be written in OpenCL, OpenCL having the capacity to natively run on the CPU and is compatible with Visual Studio, so you could CPU debug your OpenGL code in Visual Studio. Would that capacity solve the OpenGL debug problem or is the problem typically somewhere else, like actual problems with opaque GPU functionality, if that all makes sense? Um, yeah, so I guess what I would say is, I guess what I would say is, there's, 
many aspects to the GPU programming problem. Uh, and I don't think they would get solved by what you're suggesting. First, let me point out that OpenCL isn't the only thing that can be debugged uh, right, on the, on the GPU. You can install Nsight. And, you know, when, if you wave a dead chicken and at the full moon and whatever else, right, you can step through your shader code. Um, and that's a huge bonus, right? That means that shader code can kind of be debugged sort of like normal code. And that's pretty awesome. Now, I don't think that's actually similar to how CPUs get debugged. I don't think what they're actually doing there is interrupting the program in the middle of running the shader and looking at the values, which is what's happening on a CPU. I think what's actually probably happening is they're just running something that inserts something that writes out the state at that point in the shader and then pulls it back or something, and then just reruns the whole thing again to get to the next step or whatever. I don't know. Um, but I don't really know how much debugging support GPUs actually have in the same way that like an Intel chip has debugging support, right? Uh, so I don't really know about that either way, but it, for purposes of most debugging operations you might want to do, the appearance of debugging shader code is good enough on something like Nsight to get you by. And I feel like that's really all you would get from the OpenCL suggestion that you're talking about there. Uh, and the reason I think that is because there's so much more to the GPU problem than that. So first of all, the biggest problem with GPU isn't really the fact that it's harder to debug the GPU. It's the fact that you have no idea what the GPU is actually going to do at all, right? On x64, there is a specification that says, here is the binary format that will get submitted to the chip and here is what that will do. And it's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly rigorous. Like as rigorous as anything else in computing. Certainly far more rigorous than something like a language specification like the C or C++ specifications. It's way more rigorous than that, right? And what that means is that a programmer at the lowest level can know exactly what the chip is supposed to do. And Intel has literally a hardware bug, which occasionally they do have, but very rarely, if it does not do that, right? And the times when I have hit a hardware bug in an Intel CPU is actually zero. They have had them, but I have literally never had that happen to me in practice on a bug I was debugging, ever. Not a single time. Uh, and I've been programming Intel chips since probably 1985 or six, might have been earlier than that. I don't remember. I have been programming Intel chips for a very, very, very long time and that has never happened, right? On the other hand, on the GPU side of things, you have none of those things. There are driver or hardware bugs all the time. You are very likely to hit some, especially the driver bugs, right? And there is no specification for what's supposed to happen at all, right? So you have no idea even like what the ordering requirements are for a lot of the things in what you're doing. You don't even really know any of that stuff, right? Um, to a certain extent, OpenGL specifies, or you know, certain graphic standards specify certain things like two subsequent draws have to appear like they happened in that order if they target the same frame buffer or something like this, right? You know some of those sorts of things, but that's about all you really know. And so there's no binary specification. There's no rigorous uh, specification for anything else. Um, there's not even rigorous specifications for how many of things there are, right? They're completely variable. Like, I don't know, how many textures can I read from? How many frame buffers can I have? How many whatever, right? It's not like a CPU where the only variable is really like memory and thread count. Uh, there's tons of variables on a card. Even stuff like, can it do this thing? Like, you know, um, are, are very, are not even, they're not at the instruction level. They're like at a whole conceptual level, right? So I feel like when you're in that situation, 
um, and there's so much machinery, you have no idea what's going on. You write this thing, it goes through all kinds of driver software first, then it does all kinds of things in the hardware that you don't know what it's doing. You can't inspect any of that. You can't step into the driver. You've got none of this stuff. That's really the biggest bulk of the problem. And having that run in OpenCL, all that would tell you is what happens on the OpenCL implementation of this thing. But that's really not relevant to you. I mean, maybe it would help you get stuff working where the only problem with it is your misunderstanding about something in the API. Now you can step through and see a reference implementation of it. But that's about all you would get. So I think the far more interesting thing is to, to say, can we stop doing things this way and instead move towards a thing where we have a rigorous specification for an ISA like x64, where that's what you write and that is what the graphics card has to execute, right? And the reason that we don't do that is again, because it's GPU vendors want the ability to innovate across all aspects of their pipeline and they want as much flexibility to do that as possible. That'd be great uh, if the primary problem these days was graphics performance. Unfortunately for 99% of applications, it's not. The primary problem is reliability, right? Uh, and so we're at a point where the trade-off of performance at all costs is a very bad trade-off to be making. And what I think we would much rather have is stability like we have on X64, where yes, every year they try very hard to get more performance, but they don't sacrifice rigorous specification and reliable execution to get it. Uh, so a GPU ISA where we just have a binary format that's basically the same kind of thing as x64, that gets handed over and it gets executed on the GPU like a normal chip. Um, that is really the thing that we want. I am 100% certain that would be better for just about everybody, except for the very, very small case of people who are only concerned about getting the absolute maximum performance out of every generation, which is almost nobody these days. 10 years ago, it was a lot more people. Nowadays, it's nobody, right? Um, you know, it's, it's one or two games a year. And I just don't think running our whole industry off of the needs of one or two games a year is a very good idea. Uh, and I realize that's not something that GPU vendors want to hear, but I don't know. I don't think it's really necessarily the case that the only thing people will, that, that drives GPU sales is performance. I think stability is a big driver of, of sales and I think that there's a world out there that does have a lot of economic benefits that's just a world where GPU vendors deliver reliability. You know? And uh, you know, to, as an answer, I do think there are performance gains to be had by having a, a known targetable chip also, a known targetable ISA. I think you know, we may get some of that performance that you lose from the flexible uh, changes that GPU vendors can make under a non-specified, uh, not having an ISA. I think specifying an ISA does have programming benefits that will get some of that performance back because now people are not, there's no driver in the way anymore. Drivers have traditionally been a huge source of inefficiency. That would go away because there's now no longer a driver, right? Um, or if there is a driver, it's incredibly minimal and generic, just like, you know, there's no Intel, you don't have to in install a driver for your x64 chip beyond just the basics of, uh, you know, the, the, the basic Windows sort of like CPU thunking uh, stuff. Nicola, Casey, I started to program more like the way you teach and I'm liking it so far, but there's one thing that makes me feel strange. When using structs to set up some data that will be used by a function later, how can I make sure that I won't forget to set some member of that struct before calling that function? Is there a way to make sure I always initialize every member of the structure to a value other than zero? Um, no, there really isn't a way to do that. That's why I tend to use very specifically in most cases clear to zero as the default. So calling something and passing a structure that's like all zeros is the default way to use it and setting things um, involves setting things to non-zero values. I would say in general, if what you need to do 
uh, is you need to ensure that everything is set. And it's going to be very hard for you to debug your code if you can't guarantee that. Then I would advise against passing things as structs to the entry level function. And what I would do is make a wrapper function around your function that just has all the parameters of the struct. And that way, you, you have to pass them all, right? Uh, the other thing that I'll often do is if I don't care about the performance in that particular area, which most of the time you don't, um, I would say, oh, uh, there's some call or some struct that's like default version of this thing. And I call that and I start with that always. So you do struct, you know, whatever the struct is, foo params equals default foo params. Then you set the ones you care about, then you call, right? Jesse Meyer, why do you type def some structs in the render layer, but not all of them? Uh, we don't really type def anything in Handmade Hero because you don't need to in C++. But in the platform layer uh, definitions, things that are exposed to the platform layer, we have to. Uh, and the reason for that is that some people are using C-like languages, uh, and they want to use this for, for just the platform layer, like Swift or whatever, or things like this. And I guess it helps them out. It was, it was by request. People asked us to do that so that it makes it easier to compile on these other platforms. Um, like Objective-C maybe. I don't know what they, I don't remember which ones they were uh, that they were asking for that because it made it easier for them to do something. That's the only reason they're in there. Uh, C++ code, you'd never have to type def structs because structs automatically type def in C++. That's just how that works. Uh, Nicola, Casey, do you remove asserts when shipping a game? Uh, yeah, typically you just compile them out. Just used, in a sense, Vulkan provides you an ISO with strict specification, but the initialization code is quite fat. Uh, no, it, it really doesn't. Um, Vulkan does not specify anything even remotely similar to an ISA. Uh, and not only does it not specify an ISA, but it doesn't even provide an interface to what you would want an ISA to be, right? Um, it's, it's just not even close, right? Uh, I mean, Vulkan doesn't even have in it the concept that things have to support bindless, right? And an ISA that you would create today has to be bindless. I mean, that's just a basic tenet. Uh, of what you would want an ISA to be going forward. And it doesn't even really even support it pretty much unextended the Vulkan. The last time I looked at Vulkan, it didn't even support it at all, um, right? Like it, it had extremely weak support for non-binding non uh, workflows, you know, non-binding API flows. And that should be the default flow, right? Um, so, so yeah, Vulkan is in no way an ISA. It's not even close. And unless they made significant changes to it compared to the last one I looked at, which they may have. So, you know, I could be wrong about saying that. But unless they made major changes to it uh, in the, the final version, they weren't, they weren't even close to defining an ISA. They weren't even in the ballpark of defining an ISA. And the things that they did define the API, how they did define it to work, are just not even close to right uh, for, a, uh, for the way you would want a modern GPU interface to work, in my opinion. And I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe the reason for that is wanting to support old hardware. You know, Vulkan was not designed to be a modern API. It was designed actually to be a very backwards compatible API. It was designed to support chips that are quite old at this point uh, and that are quite underpowered compared to what we would want in a modern ISA to look like. Uh, and that's a real shame. Jesse 23, I didn't quite understand uh, how OpenGL and multi-threading can cooperate. I believe you once said in an episode that it, an OpenGL context is specific to the thread that created it. So if I create the context on a main thread, can I not have other worker threads call into OpenGL without somehow setting the context for each thread? Uh, so OpenGL, uh, if, if you don't use extensions to OpenGL, it doesn't really handle multi-threading properly. 
Uh, that's one of the biggest problems with OpenGL, and one of the reasons why it's really still a legacy API is that the multi-threading model in OpenGL just doesn't work. Uh, Extension-wise, it works just fine um, for the most part. If you're willing to use like you know NVIDIA extended OpenGL, for example, there's you can pretty much write uh, exactly what you want to write, and there's only really one place that it falls down, and it's a place that's not that bad to work around. Uh, do I wish they had an extension to fix that too? Sure. Uh, but that's really only the, in the platform layer. It's in the wiggle part of things, not in the open, regular OpenGL part of things. Uh, so yeah, so extended OpenGL works really great. Uh, stock OpenGL is, is absolutely horrible. And uh, again, that's because of this emphasis on binding and context that you really don't even want. And it actually makes development more difficult, but it's just a legacy of, of how OpenGL, and they, they've kind of clung to it. Um, but when you go to bindless, if you go to bind list plus NV command list, you're no longer talking to the driver pretty much at all. There's just one thing that's like, hey, here's a giant batch of an enormous amount of things to do, go do it is the only call. And that's pretty easy to keep on one thread, right? Uh, so, but yeah, regular OpenGL, no, it's just, I mean, it's, it, I could describe the various ways you can try to get uh, threading out of OpenGL, but really, uh, Really, you just can't. Um, you can try, but you will get beaten down severely. Uh, and n partially by just the way it's specified, it just doesn't work multi-threaded. Um, but more, more than that, because you know, if you read the spec for OpenGL literally, there are ways you can make it work. Um, the real problem is when you actually go to try and run it, it doesn't work on any drivers. And I mean literally any. Um, trying to run OpenGL in heavy parallel environments, it just, forget it. Uh, either you will just run into straight up non-functional scenarios, uh, or you will end up uh, with low performance. One of the two. I've never seen anyone do, get anything else. Um, but like I said, if what you want is heavy multi-threading and you don't mind about specify, you know, being more specific to a graphics card or to uh, extended OpenGL can actually support it quite well. Uh, while your submission calls still have to be single-threaded, literally everything else can be multi-threaded, and you can make almost no submission calls. You know, you can get it down to just a few a frame, even for millions and millions of draw calls, right? Uh, all right, are we done with cues? I think we are done with questions, probably. All right, looks like we're done. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining me for the episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. If you would like to follow along with series at home, you can always peer to the game uh, on handmadehero.org and it comes with a source code uh, so that you can play around with it uh, and, uh, and learn from it or experiment with it. Um, it's a, it's a pretty good learning resource. Uh, we also have a forum site you can go to to ask questions, hosted by Handmade Network. Uh, we have a Patreon page you can go to if you want to support the video series, a schedule bot uh, that tweets the schedule at you, and an episode guide uh, which will help you catch up on old episodes if you are so inclined. Uh, that is it for this week. I may not be back next week. I don't know. Um, there's a, a, we're, we're moving offices. And I'm not sure what status things will be in. Uh, I may just try to move Handmade Hero streaming back to my home, uh, to my apartment. Uh, 
but I don't really know one way or the other uh, what will happen. So I can't promise there'll be streams next weekend. We'll be back the next weekend after that, I believe. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I, I just can't promise that. So we'll see. Uh, keep, keep, keep in mind that there may not be one. Uh, I will certainly check, you know, certainly check the schedule bot Friday night because uh, it'll say one way or the other on here. Uh, but uh, but I, but no promises. We'll, we'll, I'm just not sure what the internet situation or where the machine's going to be or what's going to go on. So we'll play it by ear. Uh, that's about it for this week. Uh, until next week, uh, thanks for, uh, for joining me. And I wanted to mention again, because uh, I mentioned it yesterday, I was going to mention it one more time. Uh, if you're interested in supporting a debugger project, uh, there's a new debugger project going on uh, that you know I am interested in. in uh, one of the things that we're still doing on Handmade Hero, right, is we've got a replacement editor and we've got a replacement drawing program that people in the community have written, right? We switched to Forcoder, we switched to Milton. Uh, so the only thing we're really still using is the compiler, uh, which is Microsoft's compiler. Uh, which is okay, you know, I'm not, I don't hate it. Um, uh, but we uh, are still using their debugger, and their debugger is not the greatest uh, debugger. And it would be really cool to switch to a debugger made by the community. And there is a project now that you can support uh, that is trying to do exactly that, make a debugger that can be integrated into four coders so we basically have like our own IDE effectively. Uh, and if you want to check that out, it's lysa.handmade.network. Uh, and you can support that project. You can actually see it uh, here. Uh, it's got a Patreon page. And so if you're, if you're so inclined, uh, that's a you know, project that I'm kind of excited about. And we'll try to try it out on stream just as soon as it's gotten to the point where uh, we could do some simple debugging with it, right? Uh, we could use it in tandem with Visual Studio's debugger uh, when it gets to the point where we can sort of start to play with it a little bit. Uh, so that's it. Just wanted to point that out for people who are looking for projects to support that might be cool. That's one to check out. So please do. Uh, and then that's it for this week. I uh, will see you folks next week if uh, we do get the stream streaming situation set up. If we don't, then it'll be uh, probably the week after that. Uh, but either way, until then, have fun programming, and I'll see everyone on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.